Hello, listener, and welcome to this gameplay podcast. Uh, we will be talking a bit about content because we've had a lot of it on this pod, but the supporter episode is packed full of Black Friday related chat if you're into that sort of thing on this podcast. Though we will be getting into the gameplay side, and we have with us, as you'd expect, Foot Legend Air Japes. How's the gameplay been over this Black Friday weekend? Uh, it was good. I uh, went 18 and 2. Really, nice. the, two, the two that I lost were both extra time, which was kind of frustrating. So like I really could have put in a shift. I switched to a new variation of a false nine that I'm playing and really, really enjoyed it. Um, and that seems to be clicking for me. My teams, I wouldn't say the team's changed a ton, um, but it's certainly improved. Nice. And we also have with us Josh Excels. Hello. Welcome back. Yes, uh, thank you. It's been uh, it's been a bit of a mental weekend, really. And uh, you know, the gameplay got in the way of the menu content for me at times. <laughs> I know, yeah, it just doesn't feel like there was time. It, we're hitting a weird point where we just haven't had a haven't had a gameplay patch, or at least a big one now for a long time. And so mm. we kind of, I think, people are beginning to explore real obscure nooks and crannies of the this game engine. Yeah, it does surprise me that, and that's one of the reasons someone was asking recently. We haven't really done. Uh, an episode or a good part of an episode talking about our thoughts on gameplay because we've been kind of waiting for some kind of balancing patch which has not really come which as we've said before is pretty surprising um let's move on to our next guest who is a top and a player welcome back Hubert. yes thank you for having me definitely a uh, busy weekend with all the content and you know gameplay tied to content so definitely a lot to talk about yeah, and actually talking of, you mentioned before we started recording that you completed Dalgleish, the SBC. He's what, 2 million coins? Not that anyone would be spending raw coins to get him, uh, but he's expensive, not on Player of the Month Mbappe level, but uh, pushing towards it. How have you found him? What's your review? Yeah, I found him really good so far. Um, I just have not been blessed with any high value untradeable attackers so i feel like i could really use one so that's why i went ahead and did them obviously the icon links are really useful this year you know with giving a, a league chem to everyone so that was definitely a big reason and i think after the city game liverpool's next three are pretty winnable and i believe the icons are really or even you know all the thunderstruck players only need three wins to get the full boost or is it just the icons yeah three out of four yeah yeah, yeah so I, I think he has a good chance to get both of the boosts available for the icons. So um, I just think overall, you know, five star weak foot, finesse plus, hard to go wrong. Just a really good player who should be in the team for at least a few months. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I know you were saying, Jake, before the podcast, you're considering completing him, but then ended up doing Salah and you said that Salah's actually a fraud or something like that. I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I, so Salah falls into the category. I, that's exactly right. I was like, uh, <laughs> Do I do dog leash? I just wasn't that excited about using dog leash because I have, I think maybe last year I packed his baby version like pretty early and felt like kind of lucky. So I just used him a ton, mm. which was fine and fun. Um, f unfortunately, I packed him in the year when like <laughs> lengthy was the meta early. Mm. So he was not as useful, but still good. I So I went the Sala route because he was kind of cheapest of the Mbappe, Dagleish, Salah group, Van Dyke for me. Of course, I use like many, many people because he seems to be far and above the best center back in the game. Uh, and I usually play him on two chem. So Salah made it very easy to get him on three chem. So I figured, why not? But fall Salah falls into the character or the category of, and there's one other card that I can think of that falls into this category for me. Cards that I play against all the time that I find really, really that can be annoying to play against in the right player's hands that I just like don't get on with very well. Mm. And I think part of it is I'm the way I've been playing. I've been manually doing a lot of run triggering. And so finally at the end, I stopped doing that with Salah and his movement started like he just seems to need to do his own thing. Mm. And if you try to tell him what to do, he's maybe a little bit less effective. I also think he's a player that people just baseline know what to do with. Like everybody knows his left foot stronger than his right foot. He's got finesse plus. So what do you want to work? And I know this is a defender too. So people hit these like hero finesse shots with him against me. But I, I just much like the road to the knockouts, Luka Modric, 
I just don't find those cards to be as dominant as I feel like they should be relative to their ratings. Mm. They just they just aren't. So Modric doesn't even I don't even think I keep him on the bench anymore. Well, wow. and it's that was because one weekend I substituted him in I substituted him in off the bench for one of my more attacking midfielders in a three setup and he went entirely missing and I was like you're now a liability. Mm. You no longer are even coming to match days with us. So maybe he'll eventually make a it back from training hog. with the U20. <laughs> yeah, maybe he'll make it back from training with the U21s eventually. But right now he's stuck there. And Salah, I will say Salah feels like a player though that is like off the bench is going to be a menace. Mm. So he probably won't quite fit that bill, which is kind of what I assumed would be the case with him. I think he gives me flexibility. If I'm playing this false nine, I can play him, bring him on as a sub as the center forward in the false nine. If I need them to be a little bit more attacking, I can put him on the left or I can put him on the right. You know, when you when you start to play against some of the fullbacks that tire down a little bit, I think he, he starts to give them real problems. Funny, uh, early in that answer, you said that Van Dijk, best center back in the game, but uh, Faulty here wrote it and said, who's the best defender in FC24 and why is it Thunderstruck Varane? Uh, has anyone here? Uh, I think Faulty is wrong, Varane? so okay, that's okay. cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't played against Thunderstruck Varane, so I don't know. And I know he's got Trash Panda on he him, does, yeah. but Van Dijk has custom animations and is like, he has like all of the play styles that you would want and is like a vortex. Yeah, he, 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 I don't. Know, he's. I hadn't used Varad until I, they gave out those loans, right? And I was like, right, mm. getting him in the team because if you can't beat him, join him. And initially, I found it a little bit awkward because he's slower than my existing centre backs, I think, and less agile. But once I got used to him, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It's like having two centre-backs worth of player to get round to get past him or something. Varane yeah. or Van Dijk? Yeah, Van, Van Dijk, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. It is kind of bizarre. But uh, Varane is, I used the old Varane a lot and he is really, really good. Uh, Hugh, I think, have you used the Thunderstruck actually? Yeah, I actually packed him, um, which was pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually running him with Van Dijk, which has been pretty nice. I mean, as you should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Van Dijk is by far the best value defender, like zero debate. He's like 150k. I think that Varane's mm -hmm. like 700, 800k. So if you're thinking about upgrading, I don't think you'll notice it that much. I think um, Varane's a bit quicker and obviously the anticipate is really nice. There's just something with Van Dyke. It's like, it's like he could get away with fouls in a way. <laughs> like he'll barge into someone, absolutely send them flying to the ground no matter what their strength is. And it's never a foul. And mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't make sense because it's almost like, like he doesn't have bruiser plus, he doesn't have anticipate plus. But it's like he tackles like absolutely no one else can. And maybe it's the animations, but it's just weird because it's the exact animations from the player who is tackled that always leads to a foul. It's just never called for Van Dyke, and I can't explain it. He also has yeah. a knack of tackling straight through the back of a player. And mm. it like to, he just takes the ball away and you're like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> when I know it happens to me a lot where I feel like I'm in really good position. I'm sort of shielding it and he just like knocks the ball away and I always am left feeling like oh ah, I got Van Dyked again God, you know like <laughs> it's, it's just a real it's a real bummer do you know what? I think it might be to do with his weight I think he's like 98 kilos something really high like way higher than most other players weight wise mm. and I feel like that's going to play into the the mechanics the like physics mechanics and probably gives him like this huge physical advantage which as you say just causes him to just yeah, throw players to the ground. Um, and for some reason, it not be called as a foul. I have to say, though, I think the second best centre-back in the game is Kunde. Genuinely. He's 20k, he has quick step, he's got 84 pace. Um, and I've used him again, having not used him for a bit over the last week or so as an outside left centre-back, although switches to back four, so he's just a standard left centre-back at times. And I, I think defending in the wide areas, there isn't a better centre-back. He's better than Varane in those positions. And I don't think there's really a faster centre back when running a straight line with his kind of defensive ability because he has quick step and, and that 
is something that it's very uh, shifty. Very, yeah, yeah. He's very mobile, obviously, with the Jockey Plus as well. I, I, I've got to say, I have another shot at centre back. I've used all of them apart from the Varan Thunderstruck, and uh, it's a player that is very close to Ben's heart. And uh, considering how much he spoke about him last year, I decided this year, as soon as I could afford to, I was going to give him a go. Oh, do you know what? He's third best Kunde for sure, isn't he? I know who you're going to say. <laughs> and in the build-up to Black Friday, he dropped under comfortably under a million coins. And I gave him a little purchase. Now, I have not actually used him over the weekend. I was busy over the weekend, so I've not used him in weekly, but I have used him in a couple of Rivals games. Carlos Alberto's a joke, man. He is so yeah. good at centre-back. It's just not mm. fair. He's too good again. He has got Trash Panda Plus, but he's also got Jockey and Intercept and Relentless. And he's just all game. He's so, so good. So good. And Max Pace with a, a shadow as well, basically, isn't he? Yeah, yeah um, I, like yeah. he's... He's been the like Mbappe killer for me. I, I I think even even Van Dijk has struggled against Mbappe whenever I've come up against him, and Carlos Alberto has been the best defender I've had at like matching him or at least kind of getting more of those kind of fifty fifty BS moments go his way. Funny, he's got power shot as well. Yeah, 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 yeah I've, not, I've, I've, I've not tested that out. You'll be surprised to hear. And long ball is actually useful. Yeah, no, that is a good point. Yeah, okay, fine. Kunde can slot into third, I think, as a result of that. But he is, yeah, 20k. Um, I, I still think Van Dyke's probably better value, actually, even though he's much more. But yeah, Kunde's got to have a shout. Right. Uh, I was going to actually mention, because Kunde has quick step, which I was talking about. We had this question, which I think we've spoken about before, but it's good to talk about it again because it's something that comes up here and there. And I, I think there is some confusion. Uh, RK Chapman says, just curious if you all could cover the difference between rapid and quick step on a future pod. Also, could you describe what controlled sprint is? My guess is when you squeeze the trigger twice to kick out the ball and run on, uh, but I honestly don't know. Okay, so just very simply, controlled sprint is what you get when you hold the R1 uh, button or RB button and dribble with the player. I know you'd think it would involve pressing the sprint button, but it doesn't. Um, it's just a faster dribble, basically. In terms of the other two, it's a little bit more complex. Josh, there's a great Nepenthes video, which you edited, which breaks down every play style and what it does in game. And there's visual examples. So that'd be really helpful for people to watch if they want it visually. But just as a summary, um, quick step, uh, what does that do for a player? Yeah, so quick step's a weird thing that it, it talks about explosive sprint which has been in the game now for quite a while, but hasn't really ever been talked about too much. An explosive sprint is essentially the idea that when you sprint in a straight line, you sprint faster for a period of time. So your acceleration up to a sprint speed is faster in that straight line rather than trying to bend the run. Mm. The plays are quick step essentially affects how wide of an angle you can change at and still be in the explosive sprint in inverted commas and also increases how quickly you accelerate in the explosive sprint which is why you'll see quick step happen both in attack and in defense in a moment when you press the sprint button down from a kind of walking or jogging position you then get this very quick kind of flash above especially if you then change direction you notice it it immediately goes because the angle that you've changed at is too much for explosive sprint to continue um it's a very very effective place i think the reason why people associate it with that double tap of the right trigger to kick the ball on is because usually you or i think that works best when you're walking with the ball and then push it past to accelerate around the outside of a player that's kind of coming towards you and you will get the uh, playstyle plus icon that comes above the head in that moment because they are accelerating and usually in a straight line after the ball they've just kicked ahead the reason why quick step and rapid work so good as a combination for that is that rapid actually is less gives you less error in those knock-ons so when you double tap it gives you less of an error in terms of how far they kick it and the angle at which they kick it as well so that's why they're very similar, but they do very different things in terms of like the the outcome on the pitch. If you only have one of them, you'll notice you don't have the other. Yeah, and to be clear, quick step, because it is just about sprinting, not about controlling the ball at all, it is something that can be activated when running backwards with the centre-back off the ball, right? Uh, whereas rapid is specifically for on the ball. 
So with the regular playstyle effect for Rapid, I'll just read the text. It says, reaches a higher sprint speed when dribbling and has reduced chance of an error when sprinting or performing knock-ons. And then the plus effect is basically just a better version of that, quite simply. Any thoughts on these, Hugh, yourself, um, having tested them? Yeah, I would say uh, definitely having a player with technical and quick step is really good if you go from the controlled sprint into the explosive sprint. So like that time when you're, like you know, running at a defender, and then you want to like change directions and you know sprint past. Then that's really useful to have. But overall, I think quick steps just you know a very solid one to have. I think it's one that maybe you don't prioritize as one of the best playstyle pluses. But I wouldn't overlook it, especially with the right player like a winger getting down the line. You know, if you switch the ball out wide and you want to take off sprinting before the fullback can really close you down, it's really useful. Uh, I adore box-to-box midfielders that have quick step mm. especially if you have quick step and first touch it's one of those where the uh, players that have it when you change dir- you can just change direction in an insane way with them and i really like it on the topic of like rapid though i did the was it the centurion striker like my matthias tell evo has it rapid and i just like mm. don't even like there are times when i We'll do a right stick flick like knock on and it catches people out and it feels like pretty accurate and good. But rapid is kind of one of those that I'm like, eh, it's fine. Well, the problem with rapid is most of the players who have it already have high sprint speed anyway. So like, I, I don't know how much you're actually benefiting compared to someone who just has high sprint mm. speed. Yeah, I do feel like though, Raphael, Lauren James, Dembele, who all have the rapid playstyle plus really do feel that much quicker on the ball. And uh, I was going to say, talking of play styles, it's something we were going to discuss. Always get questions about best play styles, and we haven't talked about it for a little while. So after the break, we'll come back and talk about the ones that we're liking at the moment. Catch you again in just a second. Hello, welcome back after the break. Uh, we're getting two playstyles added to these Thunderstruck players, the regular ones, and one to the icons. And then the FC Pro players, of course, gain a playstyle at some point, and uh, playstyle plus, actually, in the new year. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about. Uh, let's go with regular playstyles, which are actually, as we saw in EA's pitch note, and I think have discussed before, really not that much worse than playstyle pluses when you consider how good some of those are. They fall pretty much directly between a player without that playstyle and what they do and what they do with the playstyle plus so still pretty strong josh are there any particular ones that you're on the lookout for i think anything that isn't a center back or potentially wing back press proven is a great playstyle to have Mm -hmm. you know with the with the pressure that the pressure tactics that we have now with you know however the depth works or when somebody flicks onto constant pressure, just the ability to roll a midfielder and control that ball for that extra kind of second longer than you are able to without it. It makes such a massive difference. And even the control you have on the ball in tight areas where kind of the game, I don't know, kind of says that you're under pressure or you're being pressured by a player. It just allows you to have a little bit more control. You get less of those erratic touches that you can sometimes get. So I think that's a big one. Any attacker, like, I, I mean, I know Toto's already got it. Lukaku's got it as well. I don't know if there's any attackers actually. Maybe Gabriel Jesus. Ariel is a play style that, like, along along with Nep, beginning to kind of really experiment with a lot. Um, if you can get somebody who can cross the ball in, whip pass would be another one for the wide players. If you if they don't have whip pass, getting whip pass on there, even as a basic play style, is massive. If you get aerial, it, it's a it can make a big difference to your ability to score headers. Oh, guys! Oh, I just opened an icon pack. Oh, <laughs> oh. he's got block plus. Wait, who has block plus? Center back. He's a midfielder from France. No, Vieira. Mm. <laughs> Whoa! Sorry, had to share. Doesn't use my first one was Sol Campbell. First one was Sol wow. Campbell. This one's better. Wow! Damn, that is. Nice. Speaking yeah. of a play Congrats. with press proven. Press proven and relentless, I believe. Oh, I wonder if he's gonna be good. Ah, oh, he is gonna be good, surely. Um you know, without wanting to take away from your massive pull, like that's all good and we're all very happy for you. Like, you know. <laughs> uh, but um that Memphis to Fi SBC uh, it got pilloried because it came out at the same time as the uh attacker Evo that kind of made a Memphis to Pi that looked 
better, but obviously he can be upgraded. And if he was to get like finesse shot added in there, maybe even like a quick step, I think he could be a very, very good card to use. So yeah, I think I think wide players whip pass is 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 definitely a big one. Long ball pass for midfielders and defenders, I I use an awful lot, especially with that R1 square kind of switching it is it's really, really powerful. And then yeah, press proven I think is the one that I would just be happy with whoever got it, obviously, and and unless it was a keeper. Although I don't think there's any keepers in this promo, are there? <laughs> I mean, actually, that could be kind of useful if you're uh, <laughs> Richard Buckley and uh, needing to waste some time here. <laughs> yeah. Totally agree with Press Proven. People all know, I think I mentioned it before, I got Centurion Zanetti, and he only has only 79 dribbling, but because he has Press Proven, he feels so solid uh, dribbling the ball, which is quite surprising. You can't expect him to take like big touches, if that makes sense, and them to be controlled or go round players, but it's going to be very hard for the opponent to get a foot on the ball if he has the ball under control, which is really useful. Hugh, what about you? Any particulars that you're often on the lookout for? I think it's interesting because, um, you know, when they're choosing these, I wonder how consistent they'll be. Like, for example, I don't know if I mentioned this, I bought the Thunderstruck Cruyff um, just because he's so good. Nice flex. (laughs) Yeah, a joy to play with. But he already has so many good play style so power shot plus he has incisive tiki taka first touch so like if they wanted to be very generous they could give him finesse shot or technical or quick step or something like that but what if they gave him like acrobat like I, i'm curious you know in terms of the market with some of these icons and players where the upgrade is kind of baked into the price people know that they're going to get at least one of the play style boosts you know if the play style ends up being a dud like acrobat or long throw or something you know mm. is that going to tank some of these prices because it's not what people were hoping for Mm. but um i will say an underrated one especially for like your marquee players like a cruyff is you know getting relentless would be really nice just like not having them get tired not having to sub off your best player like for example right now my bench attackers are that lozano pro card and then dembele they're both fine but they're not cruyff Mm. but he has he doesn't have relentless and he has 83 stamina so he's probably going to be tired by the end of a game yeah i gotta say uh, this partly comes from experience in the uh podcast discord pro clubs um but finesse shot can really be a get out of jail if your player has lowish finishing and i mean i know finesse shot plus gets a lot of chat but the regular finesse is still really pretty good it's not going to be as op from distance as finesse shot plus but it really helps if you have a player who's not the best at finishing. And I think that is the case with some of these play styles, which is worth looking out for. They can often just compensate for low stats, and that's quite mm-hmm. helpful in certain situations. I guess, as I said, with press proven as well. Um, so I'd look out for that one. Obviously, you're kind of somewhat forced into taking specific shots, but it's great this year because especially if you have finesse shot, finesse shot plus, finesse shots work well in the box, which hasn't been the case for a few cycles, and that feels quite natural and quite satisfying as well. So I'm quite enjoying that. Any other playstyles people want to just shout out before we move on? Because I think we can move on to some other chat. Uh, I guess, I mean, I don't, nobody's mentioned Travella, but like Travella Plus is kind of goofy, especially if you get a player with high finishing. Yeah, it is. And we mentioned Long Throat, didn't we, on the last podcast? And I was like, oh, maybe there'll be some more usable players coming up with Long Throw Plus. And we got Frimble. Sure enough. Yeah. So <laughs> he looks uh, actually a very good right back, right? And I mean, that's a good position to have Long Throw Plus in because, you know, they tend to take the. Uh, thrones anyway and um that could be kind of spicy i I, kind of want to get him in i don't know whether i really can in the current system i'm playing but uh, it's quite a nice option i've got one more play style before we move on uh if you struggle one-on-one finishing like kind of free one-on-one if your player has chip shot give it a go because the difference Mm. between a non-chip shot chip like chip shot play style chip shot and even just a basic one is really dramatic the height you get on them if if you kind of try chip shops and go they're so high and take so long that's like built into the play style the a place that regular play style reduces it and increases the speed and the play style plus like reduces the angle of the chip shot even more and increases the speed of it. So I also find it's it's really effective. When you get close to the keeper, if you can just lift it over them, they just fall to the floor most times. Real real quick, Ben. We did, we like haven't really mentioned the passing styles. And I will say, I think it's incisive pass. The players that have incisive pass versus the ones that don't, especially if you're playing a formation where you're trying to hit like strikers or 
wingers kind of like darting forward with an RB a or R one X. I think it is like, it's, it's pretty different. Mm. And so I, you know, that's one that I, I've, I've started more and more. So being like, Oh, I think I'm going to need this play style. Yeah, no, no, that is a really good one actually and worth mentioning at the end here. Right, let's move into a gameplay question which maybe we can get to quickly before the break. Uh, this comes in from Juicy. He says, is there a sweet spot that anyone has noticed on when to bring your keeper out? I either tend to get finessed round my keeper or they literally just walk around the keeper as the keeper falls to the floor uh, like he's grown tired of living. Uh, or is it best to just not bring them out at all? It is a good question. I think I've slowly found the right kind of spot to bring them out, but it's taken some time. Uh, Hugh, what about you? Do you just leave a keeper in the goal? Are you bring them out? What, what are you up to? I basically just try to cause some chaos with them. Um, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll start bringing them out, then I'll stop then I'll um, use the right stick to move them around a bit, just like trying to confuse the player if they think they can just wait and like tap it in that, you know, if they wait too long or hesitate, then maybe I move in front of it. And it's actually had decent success. It's just one of those things where, you know, there's only so much you can do. I wouldn't really blame yourself if you don't make a save. You know, it's a one-on-one. They should be scoring. But, you know, just try like be kind of erratic and random because worst case, they just score anyway. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Is there a particular thing that people would say is an absolute don't do this, Josh, with your goalkeeper and bring them out? If a player is in like full control of a ball and has sprinted through your line, I wouldn't at any point decide to bring them out. Like at any point. Because for me, and unless they get very close to you, like, you know, if, they, if they're in like a full sprint and they're kicking it forward, but if they've noticed your keeper come out and have the ability to touch the ball before your keeper gets there, for me, it should be 100% a goal. Like, it's so easy to just kill a keeper with a little bit of movement. They're so bad this year. So, like, I think that would be, like, the biggest no-no for me. But when it's a one-on-one situation, in my opinion, it should be a goal most of the time. There's very little that you can do. I, I I think it's people tend to kind of get a charge on when they've got defenders back sometimes. And I think that's maybe what I'd also avoid because it, especially when there's defenders around it, the keeper key kind of moves in a weird way and will like run where the player was and not where they're now going to be. And so they then just can pass it into an empty net. So yeah, to try not to do it when there's lots of players in the box. I think it's, it's more utilized to kind of create chaos like i'll just i'll just echo what was said earlier yeah they definitely don't have trash panda plus the keepers they're uh, yeah. uh, struggling to anticipate most uh, uh runs from play. actually particularly player movement right um jakes what about you any thoughts on this yeah i um i mean i i bring my keeper quite a bit mm. and i'm always trying to play reindeer games <laughs> with people uh like with their minds <laughs> i guess sorry is that is that a u.s freight i've never heard that before reindeer games it's it's from that rudolph the red-nosed reindeer song like playing his oh, reindeer games, reindeer or games. Oh, <laughs> yeah okay. it's like but it oftentimes means like you know like just for f- i don't know i feel like just for fun or like kind of just trying something yeah just trying something it's like um i will often bring my keeper as like right before i think they're about to make a through ball pass mm. like i'll start hitting it so that by the time they're like kind of receiving the pass, my keeper's like two seconds from them. And they there's oftentimes they like panic very quickly. The best players know that they can like kind of ball roll and dribble around the keeper in that situation. But not everybody is one of the best players. And it's kind of one of those situations where you can take advantage of it. I, I will say like I almost always bring the keeper, though, to some degree. Like the whole goal of a keeper coming out is to shrink the goal Mm. people are not good at chipping this year i think chipping is also like pretty hard players don't have it in their head to use finesse shot if the player doesn't have the finesse shot trait and so if you can come out and shrink the goal a little bit what you don't want to be doing is still coming out with your keeper while the player is about to shoot because the keeper then doesn't have a chance to make him i'm going to say himself because most of us are using male keepers doesn't have a chance to get big and like set and get their arms out. So you want to make sure that you're releasing the like come out keeper button. So Y or triangle before the player takes a shot so that they can set themselves. 
Mm. That's a really good point. Yeah. I think that's a mistake I see quite often people, you know, charging the keeper while you're still taking the shot. And that just means that they're not going to be able to set and make a save animation. So uh, that's a really good point. I would agree that what I tend to do is just bring the keeper out a bit, you know, get them to a point at which maybe they do then have the opportunity to charge a bit further to claim the ball off the feet of a forward. And I also agree that it's important to think about who you're playing, not just the player that's going to be taking the shot or in the one-on-one situation, but also the player you're facing and whether they seem good on the ball because if they are good on the ball, they're probably going to be pretty good at taking it around your keeper. And actually, you may want to be a bit more cautious with your keeper charge. And if they're not, then, you know, you may want to just be aggressive and play the man, not the cards. Yeah, exactly. And I think my overall kind of thought with goalkeepers, I think is similar to Hugh, really. Like you, you want to be unpredictable in the way that you use your keeper so that your opponent, who often has a well-rehearsed routine for different situations in the game, especially once we reach this point in the cycle, can't perform the routine they always perform. And, and that's what you're kind of aiming to do in a lot of situations in the game, actually. So yeah, that's probably a good place to to wrap up that question. And we'll, we'll take a break and we'll be back with, I think, possibly actually some, some tactics. Hello, welcome back to the podcast with part three. I'm going to take the opportunity at the start of this part to talk about the 3142 that I've been using. It is, I would say, probably one of the better tactics I've come up with over the last few years. It feels very effective, feels fun, and the way that it works is fairly unique, actually. I haven't seen anyone set up the 3142 like this before. Uh, it is defending, as you often see with three at the back formations in a 4-4-2 shape, which helps because I've never been especially good at defending with the three at the back. But the really nice thing is this cycle, the 4-4-2 shape is really good going forward. And what you actually have is a 4-4-2 type setup up front with two strikers and a midfield of four, but with the pivot CDM in behind when you attack, which is really nice for stopping counters. They're on cover wing, so they'll go wide and track players in the wide areas too. But the big thing is that it allows that player to pivot the ball across the pitch and your left centre mid and right centre mid don't have to act as pivots, which they would normally in the 4-4-2, and they can push forward and actually be a threat in and around the box. And this works well for the left centre mid, who is the more advanced of those two midfielders and will basically play as an additional attacker and uh, really find some good pockets of space. I'll run through this tactic. It will already be in the tactic bank in the supporter discord for gold or above supporters. And I'll put it on Twitter slash X eventually as well, which is at footweeklyben. But I'll also read it in a way that hopefully means you can take it down fairly easily as I go through. So defensive style, you want that on balanced and you want width 55 and depth 71. You can change the depth, but don't go below 45. In terms of the offense, you put build up play on balanced and chance creation on balanced too. Although I have used possession as well, and actually that may even be better depending on how you play. I think if you want to be a bit more patient in your approach, it can be beneficial. And then we have 55 width, players in the box on two, and then corners and free kicks. It's really up to you. Let's run through the instructions. And I think it's worth noting that the setup here in terms of personnel, the players you're choosing, it is more of almost like a 4-1-2-1-2 wide rather than necessarily uh, being a three at the back tactic, which will almost certainly mean you're probably going to want to start not in a 3-1-4-2. And that's something to note because some people may not know this, but you want to start with whatever formation gets your team on chemistry and then use game plans to then switch to the formation in game. Uh, first of all, let's start with the left striker who is on stay forward, getting behind. This is a, a poacher, a player who can threaten in behind. And then your right striker has no instructions on. You can play with that a little bit, but ultimately you want them to be a more creative player. And then at left mid, this is where you'd actually have a left back because they're going to play left back when you defend. Backer is perfect because she's really good at going forward. The player will be able to cross in uh, very effectively. You want this player on stay on edge, come back, stay wide. 
And then the left center mid, who's actually more of an attacking player, will defend as a left mid and uh, will be quite important for chance creation and running through on goal between the gaps that open up. That player should be just on cover wing. And then the right center mid will be on stay on edge cover wing. And when defending, they're more of a defensive midfielder, basically. So they need to be able to defend. Your CDM is on stay back while attacking and a cover wing. And they're just your standard defensive midfielder, really. I use uh, Centurion Zanetti. And then at right mid, you have stay on edge and stay wide. The reason why you're seeing stay on edge a lot is because I feel like you can easily crowd the box too much. And late runners are really important when defenses start to get set you'll still get players entering the box don't worry about that but not everyone charging in and that right mid is really just a right mid in any normal 442 or something like that you want them to be fairly direct fast able to create from the wide area so fairly standard your left center back does need to be pretty quick actually i use kunde because as I talked about before, he is one of the faster centre-backs and really good defending in those wide positions. Your left mid will take a little while to come back, so you do need that. The centre-centre-back can be a pretty standard centre-back, really. And then the right centre-back, really at this point, unless you have Carlos Alberto, you've got to use a right-back with high defensive stats and ideally some good defensive play styles like uh, Anticipate, Intercept, etc., Someone like the Evolution, Marcus Lorente, if you did them, is going to be really good. That high defensive work rate is also important. And then the keeper, I have on sweeper keeper, and comes for crosses. So there we go. That does wrap up the run through of the tactic. As I said, very effective. Seems to suit this game really, really well. And uh, the thing I would just highlight, which I think may be missed, is that that left center mid should really be an attacking player. You know, I used I think even Zola there for a bit, and he was pretty good, especially if you want to do some <laughs> finesses. But it does need to be someone who's good in attack. You don't want, for example, even though it might seem like it, someone like Bernardo. He'd be good, Bernardo Silva, but not as good as a proper attacking player. Right, hopefully that does make some sense. And as I said, you'll have success with it. It seems to have worked exceptionally well for me, to be honest. So interested to hear how people find it. I think what could be uh, what could be fun with that tactic, if you set set it up in the pod RTG account at some point and kind of use the players that you would use if you were using that account. And then I'll, uh, I'll give it a run this week and can kind of report back next week on how I found it. Yeah, a great idea, actually. I think it is a little tricky to get your head around. It's a, a bit more unique in terms of the way that players move around than other formations. It creates good movement, though, definitely. I think we can move into a final gameplay question. Here's one from... Bev Weiser, he says, feel there has been a shift in how people are scoring. Now it is not just cutbacks, but also whipped crosses uh, to aerial and power header strikers, especially as everyone seems to have backer, including myself. What's the best way to defend whipped crosses? I have Blanc and VVD, but still find myself caught out every now and again. Cheers and love the pot. Um, well, yeah, I think that is a good point because we talked about how to score crosses the other week. It is very hard to defend whipped crosses, particularly um, from players with whip cross plus, like Backer. Um, Japes, any particular bits of advice that you might have for people wondering about that? Part of the reason I feel like they're so effective at the moment is because people are using these tiny fullbacks all over the place. And so like I've started using big wingers. Like I prefer big wingers. And if I'm going to play like that, like, of course, I'm going to cross it. Like, I'm going to get chances to get easy goals because of that. Like, I use Baca, and I fully, fully expect to give up a potential Baca cross against me, like each match, you know? And it's it's just one of those things that, like, when I'm playing against that, I have to be very cognizant of the space and the timing of when I think it would be best to do a whipped cross myself. And if that's, if that is indeed the case, then I have to make sure to defend against the whip cross, which means bringing my fullback out to defend higher up the pitch than normal. I do believe that it's made the game like open up quite a bit because people have to actually come out of their box to appropriately defend the whipped cross. So, mm. Uh, like, I really like it. If you are struggling mightily, then just get big fullbacks. Like, mm. you can't use Baca. So, you either have to, like, step up and defend Baca when she's trying to cross it, or you have to deal with the consequences of it. Yeah, I do feel like, you know, even using big centre-backs, 
just because whip crosses are very accurate and can often pick out players who are coming into space in the box. If you have late runners, they're very hard to pick up. And it's more, yeah. Josh, I guess, about blocking the cross, right? Knowing who your opponent's using and what their relative strengths are, I think is more important this year than than I've ever felt it be before. And one of those mm. one of those things is specifically are they right footed or left footed, and do they have finesse or whip cross, and how like whichever one of those they have that's the side to defend on. You know, if they've got whipped cross, you want to go and stop them from just running straight down the line. But if they don't, if they're if they're coming, you know, if, they, if they're going to go in on their strong foot and try and finesse it for the far corner, then you want to mark the cutback as much as possible. So I think, I think a lot of it is about situational awareness of what your opponent is trying to do. And if you've got that, then you like you most of the way there to kind of stopping it because you're going to probably be positioning positioning yourself in the right spot but i kind of like it because i do think crossing has been an underutilized part of the game for a while and i think that most people are using that basher and and it is kind of you got to take your own medicine at times because she she does get beaten in the air <laughs> quite easily so there's a there's a bit of give and take with it but I, I i think it's all about how you defend the wings and i think if you're quite an aggressive defender at kind of trying to mark somebody cutting back inside it, it this will be a big learning curve and a big struggle because it's it is quite different to the wing play style we've had before which has very often been to cut back and play a pass or cut back and finesse in or traveller depending on what it is or drive the byline of course and cut yeah or drive the byline and because drive the byline is another thing that's very overpowered and difficult to stop that that's why i kind of always err on the side of like stopping them from being able to get down the wing. And and that means I'm able to block the cross a little bit better. But it, it does leave me open to people cutting inside and just banging it top bins from 35 yards with uh, Salah, you know? Oh, oh we're going to have a player with whip cross plus and finesse shot plus at some point, aren't we? And five-star weak foot. Hopefully by that point, there's a slight nerf to those two things. But uh, Hugh, any points to make to finish off here? And actually, if it's another gameplay tip, please go for it because I guess, you know... You yeah, I would say with the whip crosses, um, definitely put your keeper on comes for crosses. That way, if they don't get the power right, you know, you at least have that chance of grabbing it before it gets to anyone. Um, and then, like Josh mm. said, you know, knowing who your opponent has, if they're... If the person or the player they're crossing to isn't that good in the air, then, you know, grab a center back and you can probably defend it fairly easily yourself. Um, if it is someone like a Lukaku, Morientes, something like that, then your best chance is probably to be more aggressive with your fullback um, and closing down the player who's crossing before they can do so. And it's not even necessarily just getting out close to them, but it's like cutting off where they would run to to make that cross. So sometimes even if you're just standing in front of them, even if you're not the closest, you can just discourage them from even trying to get into that area. You know, keep them crossing from really deep or really close to the byline. Either way, it makes it a lot harder than that kind of sweet zone, which is maybe five to 10 yards outside of the 18 yard box, where that's, you know, room to whip it in without getting too close to the keeper. The sweet zone. Yeah. <laughs> it's really effective, but you have to do it from the right areas, I think, because otherwise you end up putting too much power and it flies past or the keeper claims it. So it's, it's not impossible to stop. You just have to kind of force them into less than ideal places to be doing it. Similar to like a finesse shot. If you force them into the direct middle of the pitch or like really far wide, then the finesses aren't that good. The finesses are best from like around the corner of the box, you know, maybe slightly further back so you can bend it and get it over the keeper. But if it's, if the angle's off, it, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. It's funny actually you mentioned my tactic earlier at this point the thing that I've actually found quite helpful about having less players in the box is that you end up with your more attacking midfielders in that formation uh, loitering kind of around the edge of the box and when you get into position to do a whip cross with backer probably those players when you do that cross actually move into the box to come to the ball and are often in space in front of the center back. Don't try to head it with those players. Ball. But obviously, yeah, don't try to head it with those players. Uh, it never I know, goes it's, very well, I know it's tempting. Yeah, yeah. But if they're going to volley it, you could do it. And obviously, you can take it down. You generally have enough space to take it down. So it's a really consistent way, actually, of scoring from wide positions. And I myself, even though I've always been a fan of obviously skilling, cutting in, stuff like that, uh, crossing is just so good for 
having that unpredictability, which then allows you to cut in, like the amount of times I've cut in with backer and people are like, what, what, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, it is, it really helps. So it's a good point to make. Um, I think on that, we're ready to wrap up. Uh, it's been a hectic week of Ultimate Team um, and I'm sure there are plenty more coming ahead. But yeah, Hugh, I guess you'll be uh, maybe adding uh, some stuff to the tactic bank. It might be nice to get your false nine tactic in there, actually. Uh, I guess you haven't added it yet, but it'd be good to see that. Um, thank you very much for coming on. As Thanks always. for having me. Always good to talk EAFC, especially with all the content and gameplay things going on now. So if you have any questions, lots of us in the Discord, definitely um, hop in there if you're a member um, and, you know, chat with us lots of people sharing tactics ideas and tips and you know even more than what's on the pod you know getting lots of different responses is sometimes really interesting you know you hear things ideas that no one's really thought of doing because you know people are testing things so that variety of opinions is really cool yeah it's definitely a good reminder yeah jump in there if you're gold or above supporter there's a a link in the description of this podcast which can help you to join the discord if you haven't done so already right uh on to you josh thank you very much for joining us on this pod yeah, thank you. And, and just because we haven't mentioned it yet, like I'm looking forward to trying to recreate Garnacho's outrageous overhead kick in uh, <laughs> in the game this week. Yeah. Yeah. And to Japes as well, as always, and great to have you back on the pod. Cheers, Ben. Enjoyed it. Uh, always, you know, enjoy the the gameplay side of things. In addition, I mean, the content was insane this week, but mm-hmm. gameplay is actually like I feel we're due for a patch. And I'm really hoping it improves it, but I'm I feel like I'm starting to settle in to what gameplay is this cycle. Yeah. There's definitely potential there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I feel like the potential really is there. And I just hope we do get that patch just to solve a few of those things which are starting to grate on people, I guess, in the game. Thank you very much, uh, as always, to all your listeners for tuning in. A reminder, you can catch the podcast on all the various podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. And on YouTube, if you're catching the podcast there, then do leave a like, drop a comment. I always read them and it definitely helps us out. And of course, if you'd like extra podcasts, you can become a supporter. Just search support for weekly. It's a great time to do so. If you are already supporting, then a huge thank you and a big thank you too to those Icon patrons. Dave B, Hugh J, Darren W, Alistair M, Don P, Rob P, Jeff B, Damon H, Tom B, Adam G, Neil P, Alex M, Jake S, Dan W, Roger D, Lee A, Andrew C, Nishant, Waterman, Dylan H, Adam R, Rob L, Brendan W, Michael K, David G, Jimmy K, Michael B, Aditya S, and Joshua K. Plus a special thanks to Luke M, Dave B, Hugh J, Tom M, Darren W, and Pato Foot for advice and production assistance. Before I leave you, just one more thing to add, though. FIFA's a bit like life, really. It has its many ups and its many downs. If you're having a few more downs than ups in real life in these more difficult times, then please don't feel that you're alone or need to struggle on without taking action. If you go to thecalmzone.net, there's loads of resources, advice, support, or even just a friendly chat for anyone who needs it. If it sounds like it could help you, then head over to thecalmzone.net. And for now, have a good one, and I'll catch you on the next podcast.